Welcome to yet another exclusive uh, CNBC Africa conversation. Uh, this time hot on the heels of what's been happening uh, this week uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, scaling infrastructure development on the continent. For the interest of time, let's jump straight into the heat of the matter. Uh, now, uh, um, we've discussed about uh, the inf infrastructure financing uh, gap, 130 to 170 billion. We've had this conversation over and over, but this time we need to delve straight uh, from the macro to the macro, uh, micro variables. Let's start off with what we know. We would like to open up Africa, but we've discussed the issue on de-risking, bankability of some of the projects that are getting into the infrastructure space. And we need to understand what has been done, what continues to be done, and what remains some of the impediments and challenges, even when we are facing buckets of investments and uh, buckets of policy support. To help us uh, break this uh, down, of course, uh, um, uh, understanding that uh, right at this conference, we had the President Uhuru Kenyatta come in and uh, double the shareholding uh, within the African context. So we have the Africa 50 CEO, uh, Alain Ebobise, uh, on my left. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. A man who's talked about de-risking, I've had that uh, sentence maybe uh, 20,000 times within uh, your term in office, President Akinumi Adesina, of course, heading the African Development Bank. And we have uh, on the extreme left, who will be taking the heat for most of the questions in regards to Kenya, that is now double, double shareholding. Of course, you've mentioned that uh, electricity has uh, um, uh, been set to a stage where we can now uh, give to the community, given the progress on infrastructure. So we have the CEO of the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry for Nairobi County, uh, Nemaisa Kireni as well. Thank you very much, panelists. Uh, for joining us. Now we have uh, levels of uh, this conversation, and we'll start off with you, uh, President Resina. We talked about this de-risking, but let's put it all into a context to, to kick things off. We want to de-risk investment to make it bankable before approaching the private sector for funding. Basically you, then her, then him, right? But Given what has happened with the African Development Bank and what happened with the African Investment Forum, which we saw chart uh, the path to this and s draft some of the policies that are now being implemented by Africa 50 as well, what did you know to how dire is the situation right now? Well, I think uh, it should, we'll be talking about how exciting uh, the situation really is. Um, you know, people talk quite a lot about the amount of financing gap for infrastructure in Africa. Yes. The African Development Bank just did an analysis which showed that it's anything between $68 billion to $100 billion. But that's in terms of quantum of money that the gap is. I'm not scared of that amount of money. Uh, the fact is that the opportunities are there for those investments to actually happen uh, for three reasons. First and foremost is we need investment vehicles that will allow us to be able to tap into private sector, not just public money, uh, going to that infrastructure. And as you know, um, uh, I'm also the chairman uh, of Africa 50, we just held our, uh, our you know, our general uh, shareholders meeting here. And the Africa 50, which Alan shares, uh, is the CEO, is what the African Development Bank, we helped to set it up, uh, so that we can actually leverage private capital uh, into infrastructure space uh, 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 in, in Africa. The second is a number of exciting investments that the African Development Bank is already making in infrastructure. If you take the case of energy, for example, we are in investing already roughly $12 billion in the energy space uh, with, a, you know, uh, uh, with a hope of leveraging anything between 45 and $50 billion uh, you know, into that particular sector. Uh, take the case of energy in, in, in Kenya. Uh, we've invested in, in Kenya in a whole range of uh, energy going from renewable energy with the Lake Tukana project, uh, which is the, the, we have a geothermal project, a Menangai a geothermal project. And these are actually exciting projects. And as, I'm sure, as she will tell you, um, you know, the, the last mile project, which is, is, is something to have connection, I mean infrastructure, the other one is to connect people to infrastructure. And the last mile, last mile uh, project has connected probably about 3.3 million people in Kenya alone to electricity. So it's exciting in terms of what is being done. The opportunities to do things differently in terms of public and private investment is what you see. And I think that the kind of things that we are doing at the bank, um, you know, de-risking um, projects is very, very important. Take the case of Lake Tukana or the case of the geothermal project. There are particular risks involved for the investors uh, that we have to actually use uh, partial risk guarantees to reduce the risk of exposure uh, of the IPPs, uh, inter integrated power projects, to government not meeting its obligations. And those are the kind of things that we do normally so I think that the instruments are there. 
I think new vehicles, platforms of uh, delivery such as Africa 50 and the work that we are scaling up in the African Development Bank provides me the excitement that I know that we'll be able to close this uh, uh, investment gap in not too long a time. Right. Before we get to the matter on policy support, let's just uh, touch on financing slightly. Um, so we've worked on debt financing, senior debt financing as well, and we've tried to look at different angles. I know even the African Development Bank had its hand on trying to structure that, uh, still in regards to structure financing. But now we have something that has come about more prominently, equity financing, which most people don't understand. And we are struggling seeing even the private sector understand how exactly the government will take part when they were not involved in the prior uh, conversations or prior operations before. So help us understand how uh, diverse uh, this conversation will be. Well, first of all, I should uh, start by saying that I share the excitement of uh, President Adesina, who is also the chairman of the board of Africa 50. And uh, in fact, uh, I see those challenges uh, that you mentioned as opportunities, uh, because these are investment opportunities when they are well structured. I also want to emphasize the fact that uh, the African Development Bank, uh, who basically we part of the African Development Bank Group, uh, has all these instruments to help de-risk the project. Um, but let me focus on your question on equity. Uh, I think equity is quite important in structuring those kind of uh, PPPs in the infrastructure space. Uh, as of now, there's still quite a bit of debt available to fund projects, uh, but the missing gap is the early stage equity to help build up a pipeline of bankable projects, to make those projects bankable so that they can receive the large sums of financings which are sitting on the sideline looking for good projects in which they can invest. So that's where the equity, or especially the early stage equity, comes in. And that's what Africa 50 actually will be focusing on. Africa 50, we decided, uh, under the guidance of uh, this chairman and the board and the management, we decided that we're going to focus on equity because that's where we can actually make the biggest impact here um, in, in trying to advance the agenda for infrastructure. We believe that, like other emerging regions, Africa can receive significant private capital in the infrastructure space but we need to figure out a way to get more bankable projects to the finish line. So, and that's what we're going to be working on. Right now, well, the, the two organizations obviously are working um, in form of a hybrid. Uh, let's, let's just get perspective from the private sector because um, sometimes it trickles down, but the private sector is holding an umbrella and doesn't want it to rain on them. Um, Let's touch on uh, maybe the examples that we've been given. We've had um, issues on power primarily highlighted because infrastructure has touched on them more uh, prominently. Senegal, Nigeria, of course, uh, uh, Africa 50 mentioned that uh, as we opened. But uh, in the case of Kenya, um, ideally when you hear about 25% shareholding, maybe from a, a government perspective, just on the basis level, we'd like to know what uh, the private sector is uh, hoping would be addressed before we see a lot more uh, prominence from the government. Just help us uh, uh, understand this. I think the policy space for private sector in terms of how to work with government has not been clearly defined. One of the biggest challenges we face is how do PPPs work? and how do effective PPPs work. In Kenya, we have that challenge. If you look at what we did with the standard gauge rail, that's one of the projects that private sector should have participated in, but private sector didn't actually have the opportunity. We are now sitting back and saying, we should have been there at the forefront. We are now lobbying to get 40% local content, but that's still a challenge. We have our rail being run by the Chinese, which is a challenge for us because the aim of involving ourselves in these projects is so that we can have uh, more jobs created, um, increase our economic output, and this is actually not happening because our involvement was not at the forefront. So the policy space is still quite green for ourselves in Kenya, and that's actually an area that we must um, work to improve. Um, possibly just a uh, mention on the same part. Uh, so um, the bit on uh, the SGR, for example, is something I'm, I know you've probably heard the feedback where we saw the earlier involvement or the earlier deal that was mentioned in regards to infrastructure was that we would have a team come in and set up external investors and then the local counterparts would take on the project. But this has not been the case. So ideally when we have scenarios such as that and they're replicable across the continent, how do you handle it? When we, we want to assure investors and the private sector that the shareholding we gave is the one that will stay to uh, on paper? Well, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a believer in people doing anything for Africa. You know, Africans have to do things by themselves. And with, with the amount of capacity that we have in Africa, the key is Africans must be, or African business, private sector and institutions must be at the center of how they structure those deals. Uh, of course, if you need capacity, as you have rightly mentioned, to be able to do PPP, PPPs are going to be the ways of the future. But most of our institutions don't have the capacity to actually structure the PPPs properly. Mm 
And the second one part of it is that even if you structure it properly, is how you actually pay for the service. Uh, you know, whether it is a toll road, uh, whether it is energy project in which you need cost reflective tariff, or whether you look at the toll road in which you have a viability gap in which the government will have to pay to cover some of the, of the, of the gaps to, to make it viable for the private sector. Uh, the key is we need Africans at the center of it. And that's why, at the African Development Bank, we let the development of what is called now the Africa Investment Forum. Uh, because the Africa Investment Forum idea is to bring together businesses and investors from Africa, interface them with those where the, uh, the global pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and other institutional investors, and leverage those monies into uh, projects in Africa. I mean, Alain would tell you that at um, Africa 50, he and his team are working flat out to be able to get bankable projects to that. I've got my team at the bank working flat out to get bankable projects onto that platform. At the end of the day, what I think uh, we should be doing is structuring joint ventures between African companies and those that want to come into Africa and deliver it, and making sure that we build our capacity to execute and to deliver on this project profitable and viable rate of returns on them. Uh, and I, I would love to hear your thoughts on resource mobilization, but before we, we leave that, uh, there's something crucial that has been mentioned, negotiating. Um, when we had the AU and, of course, the AFCFTA got us very excited about how we would work things out, but there was one element that was highlighted. We need to renegotiate a lot of contracts, right, on the African context, but this go way far back in with uh, contracts that are going to last maybe 30, 40 years from now. Um, minerals, for example, something that has the capacity to help Central Africa. So. What is the perspective that we're not seeing, that you're seeing within the institutions yourself in terms of renegotiation? Well, let me say first and foremost that Africa is not, by any means, a poor continent. It just happens to have a lot of poor people. And Africa has a tremendous amount of resources, natural resources, whether it's oil, whether it's gas, whether it's minerals, whether it's metals. We have vast amount of land for agriculture. 65% of the uncultivated arable land left to feed 9 billion people. In 2050, it's not in Latin America, it's not in Asia, it's not in the United States, and it's not in Europe, it's in Africa. So the key is how we exploit and use our natural resources to our own advantage. But that's where the problem has always been, uh, is that we negotiate royalties and taxes on the exploitation of natural resources in Africa in a very asymmetric manner. You know, you want to have somebody build you a road in exchange for having a mining license. That doesn't make any sense. And I, Africa has gone into a number of these things in the past, which has not been in its interest today nor in the future. Um, so what are we doing about it? I would say three things. First is helping African countries to renegotiate a lot of those contracts they've had entered into because they were very asymmetrical in terms of the power of the, of the negotiation. I'll give you two concrete examples. Take the case of uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, in which we actually helped them to renegotiate their debt obligations on contracts that they have actually entered into with China. We helped them to renegotiate that, those debt obligations down by 94%, because we have something called at the African Development Bank, the Africa Legal Support Facility, that allows you to build world-class lawyers and uh, negotiators to be able to do that. Another example is the case of Guinea. Uh, Guinea can, you know, has a lot of capacity to be able to produce uh, a lot of uh, things for, for, for aluminium, but they entered into contracts that were, again, not very good. We've helped them to renegotiate. So Africa Legal Support Facility helps with a lot of, of that. The other part of it is um, what happens uh, with regard to even understanding uh, the amount of resources you have. And most times we don't even understand whether it's marine resources, a blue economy, or whether it's even oil and gas. Uh, the African Development Bank has what's called the, the uh, Africa Natural Resources Center uh, that help countries to be able to uh, map and develop and understand and know the amount of resources they actually have so that when you're negotiating, you know absolutely what you, uh, what you have. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the capacities, again, needs to be built in our public institutions on how to negotiate in a way that benefits you uh, not, uh, 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 not, uh, not others. Uh, but it's not just even others coming to exploit Africa's resources. Why is it that Africa's own uh, you know, institutional investors are not getting into those areas? You know, I don't see why uh, sovereign wealth funds of Africa are investing in the sovereigns of others, but not investing in Africa. These institutional investors should be investing 
you know, with long-time capital in the development of infrastructure and exploitation uh, of our natural resources. And that's why I really believe that we really do, when you come back to infrastructure, natural resource exploitation, we must create uh, asset classes for many of these institutional investors for infrastructure to allow us to be able to take advantage of those. You know, we, our resources can be for others. It has to be for the benefit of Africa. Perfect. L let's just uh, then uh, do a deep dive into the kind of resource we have, whether financially or otherwise. And we'd like to talk about Africa 50 uh, for a while. We've had uh, the different players that have come about with uh, probably different tactics to try and uh, mobilize resources. 0.2% uh, levy, of course, was mentioned, uh, expanding the tax base, uh, trying to diversify our portfolios, government securities papers. We can name it. It's endless. But now the pressure is on Africa 50 because you have this new term, new resource mobilization, new strategies for resource mobilization. How new is new? Or what are we working with that has not been dealt with tra the traditional way that we should see you put a lot more focus on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I like to say that um, I'm a big fan, I'm a big supporter of having uh, local uh, businesses uh, participate in this project as minority shareholders, sometimes as controlling shareholders. So I want to support what you said, that this is absolutely important. It's an element also of, of de-risking the project and, and making impl implementation faster. So we need to make sure that that happens a bit more. Now, in terms of resource mobilization, uh, yeah, we're offering uh, one way to mobilize resources uh, from, first of all, from government shareholders, but the resources that the government shareholders, who are shareholders of Africa 50 and the African Development Bank and two central banks, uh, we consider these as a seed capital uh, to allow us to go to the market to raise significantly more resources, to channel those resources into infrastructure in Africa. And one of the instruments that we are offering uh, would be a third party fund that Africa 50 will set up uh, to try to offer uh, institutional investors an asset class, uh, which the chairman was mentioning earlier, which is attractive for, the, for us to invest in. Uh, we have to know that uh, institutional investors won't invest uh, in anything, really, if they don't uh, believe that they will get a fair return. Okay, so what we are doing now is to put together this fund so that uh, we have a pipeline of projects that will be presented to this fund and that those institutional investors will feel comfortable enough to come in and invest in Africa 50. We are targeting about $3 billion. But I, ha I want to come back to Africa Investment Forum as well, which is a great initiative from the chairman, from the president of the African Development Bank, because that's also another way to mobilize resources, because when we go there and present bankable projects uh, the, uh, during this forum, there will be institutional investors that will be present at that forum and also looking at the project that we present and then also uh, fund those projects, we hope. They will, we have to have different ways of mobilizing this capital. Our goal will be to tap those long-term savings from within the continent first, but also from outside, but let's start within the continent, but offering different ways for these uh, people, these fund managers, to feel, to feel comfortable, comfortable that they can invest profitably in infrastructure in Africa. You don't expect the long-term Australian investors to invest in those areas, but we can take the risk. That's why we are there. But once we've done that, we've developed the project, and you have uh, a, a very uh, clear uh, stream of income or revenue from it, we can pass that on like a baton okay, to the others because they're looking for uh, a very stable returns into that. So it's very important that we, we deal with the upstream issue of project development, financing the high risk part of it, and then getting the, on the relay side, the insurance investors, then they can invest you know, to, to, to make it uh, work. We can, we, we can offload it to them right. at that point. Speaking of offloading, uh, let's just get a, a local context, maybe, for example. Um, uh, we had uh, the uh, Center of International Private Enterprise, SIPE, uh, from the U.S. as well, uh, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce here get into an agreement that uh, was set to have maybe the products here being launched into the U.S. market, right? And um, we're set to see that December 2018 go into three counties and then move on. By the time that's done, move on to the U.S. market. And then 19, 2019, 2020, expand locally. So this ideally works because, uh, as we were talking earlier, they noted that the infrastructure in Kenya was sufficient. So how now do you tap in, given that growth opportunity, into what's being talked about maybe from an international level and still make it count as individually as possible? I think um, when it comes to like the US market, for instance, and why we're in the partnership with Center for Private Enterprise, SIPE, is because we find there's a capacity challenge in Kenya in terms of how do we address the US market. We don't understand what they need and the, capacity, the, the quantities they require. So we need somebody to come in and tell us and show us if you maybe come together as 
groups rather than an indi individual, you can then um, attain what you need for the US market. So a fund like this one, which is innovative and smart, yeah, helps us address those challenges because it has put together funds that we can tap into to address the challenges we face with actually getting Agoa to work for us. So through the Center for Private Enterprise, they want to build capacity within um, some counties to begin with and create what they're calling centers of excellence. So through these centers of excellence, transfer capacity and have a ripple effect in terms of how people do business with the US and internally in the local market. What, what are some of the impediments maybe trying to reach to access such a bucket? I mean, you could tell us from a very hands-on approach. Actually, I think a lot of people don't know that they can. They are actually afraid of getting into that kind of a, um, a situation. We are afraid of risk. Yeah, and we need to get over our risk averseness in Kenya. We want to do something that works and is solid. Yeah, for most people, the big funds, the pension funds, all of them are looking for something that's sustainable and long term. It must be cost effective for them to come and engage. But because we, our eyes are very focused in a small space, we don't get into that, um, those kind of investments. But if you look at America, the men who built America, one of the things they did is they took a lot of risk. Vanderbilt, Carnegie, Rockefeller, they built America based on risk taking. And sometimes the risk taking they did would hamper their business. But at the end of the day, they still managed to get the country up and running. They are very good in, um, infrastructure projects they started. They started the rail lines. Yeah, they started um, the steel which drove the American economy. So we need to change how we look at things and we need to be able to think big. When we're looking at investment, we need to think about something the world really needs and produce that. And we are able to. In Kenya, we do a lot of copying. We don't innovate per se. We just want what is safe. And that's some of the challenges that we face when it comes to walking into funds like Af what Africa 50 has and using that to um, improve our economy. I have great expectations, uh, great excitement about the African continent. And it's not just because you want to be rosy, right? Folks said in the past, Africa rising, but Africa is not rising. Well, that's, those are the kind of appellations that people use. It doesn't have any meaning as far as I'm concerned. The fact of the matter is Africa has never gone down. Africa went through challenges like every other continent went through challenges. And they came out of their challenges. So will Africa come out of its challenges? So I don't subscribe to those that would say, whether well, that's Africa is rising today or Africa is not rising tomorrow. Um, you don't say that for Europe, you don't say that for Brexit, you don't say that for uh, Asia. So why is that an appellation that we should get used to? I think we should get rid of that because for me it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't make any sense. But take a look at what has happened in terms of economic growth for Africa. Today, Africa's economic growth, GDP growth rate is 4.3%. You know, and you take a look at it from where we were coming, it's still above a lot of the global average. But that doesn't even tell you the entire story. You've got 30 countries that are growing at five, you know, three to five percent and, and even above uh, that. And so that tells you that you take a look at Kenya, you take a look at Tanzania, you look at Rwanda, you look at Senegal, you look at Cote d'Ivoire, you look at those countries that are growing, even Ethiopia is growing at 10 percent. And so I don't buy the kind of normalization of African countries. That's the first thing. Secondly, is that why should Africa not develop based on what it has? Africa has, as I said, tremendous amount of resources. What we must do is to be smart in unlocking our own resources that we have uh, 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 on the continent. And that, for me, uh, is not something that we should be doing relying on just external parties. Africa should actually use its own sovereign wealth funds, its own pension funds, its own you know, insurance pool of funds to be able to do that. But even talking of all the others, you know, if you have today, you have today $120 trillion or global savings pool that is out there. If Africa can just leverage a little bit of that, we will close all of those gaps that you talk about in no time. Take, for example, the amount of taxes that we collect in Africa. Today, the amount of taxes we collect in Africa is roughly $500 billion a year. Okay, you're talking about $70 billion gap. Well, if you just simply devoted 10% of that to infrastructure, you close 50% of that every year. So I think it comes down to also uh, an allocative decision that are we making the right allocative decision in how we use our public uh, financing to support the areas of growth and development that we should have. And I also think that at the end of the day, if we use our taxes properly, if we have public expenditure efficiencies,
And if we are able to leverage the global pension funds and others through the kind of vehicles that we have in Africa 50 has, I don't see why we will not be able to do that. I am a firm believer in Africa developing with pride. I don't believe Africa should develop with aid. I don't believe Africa should develop by grants. I think Africa should develop by the discipline of investments. And there's absolutely no reason why Asia can do that, Latin America can do that, Europe did that, and why can't Africa? I think it all comes down to believing in ourselves, believing in how we use our own resources, and believing at the end of the day that nobody should allow, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be, not to be put into labels. It's for Africa to develop and to accelerate its own development, but it must do so with pride. Right, I would like to wrap up now, but just uh, in 20 seconds, maybe your parting shot on how deliberate we need to be as we get into such partnerships, and then we'll hear the last word uh, from Ale. I think as um, the private sector here in Kenya, we must, we must take the risk. Yeah? We must come out and support what one, our president is doing with the big four. Biggest challenge we are finding there is that we don't actually know how we're going to implement it. It's a good idea. But how does private sector engage? Private sector is going to drive that. And through funds like um, Africa 50, we'll achieve that. Uh, we can't go without you mentioning the opportunity cost and how much it costs us not to do anything. We've done a whole 30 minutes without you highlighting that. Maybe you could give that uh, as your parting shot as well. Well, absolutely. But I have to say also that I agree that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be talking about slogans, uh, Africa rising. We should talk about what is happening on the ground. And me, having seen what is happening across the world in the emerging market, how these other regions have been able to receive a lot of investment, I believe that the ingredients are now in place in Africa to substantially, substantially increase the volume of investment. With those new instruments, the Africa Investment Forum, Africa 15, etc., we will get there because it has, been, it has been done in other places and we see that happening here. We need to scale it up. <laughs> and indeed, we need to speed up the implementation because delaying projects costs money. Uh, so that's very important because what? If you don't build the power plant, if you take too much time to build it, people will use other sources of energy which are extremely more costly. Right. That's the point that I'm trying to make, that this is a huge opportunity, opportunity cost by not getting projects done quickly enough. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for that. We really do appreciate uh, your insight. Uh, we've been speaking to Ebobise Alain, who's the CEO of Africa 50. We saw what's been happening this week and we'll continue to highlight it on the channel. President Akinumi Adesina heading the African Development Bank. And of course, uh, uh, Nemesa Kiereini uh, from uh, the Chamber of Commerce here in Kenya. Thank you very much, of course, for the Nairobi County. Now, we have a lot more coverage uh, in regards to what's happening in infrastructure development and scaling it from uh, different tiers. So stay tuned to the channel. We'll be sure to highlight as much as possible with our eyes and ears on ground. I've been your host, George Ndurango. Keep it CNBC Africa, first in business worldwide.